Okay, we've been through our oxidation reduction scheme of alcohol, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, and going back and forth there. Another very important reduction to look at reduction scheme is reduction of alkenes and alkynes. And we'll start with our alkenes. And the way we reduce alkenes is through catalytic hydrogenation. We've just pumped in some H2 gas, some hydrogen gas, but that won't do anything unless there's a catalyst. So we use palladium on carbon. The metal palladium uh, kind of fused to carbon, uh, basically to graphite, and that will catalyze the reaction. Note, this is heterogeneous catalysis. The palladium on carbon is a solid. H2 is usually a gas pump through a liquid of our alkene or our, our alkene dissolved in a solvent. And so it's heterogeneous catalyst. Because it is heterogeneous and this is a solid, it is syn addition only because the solid provides a surface for the molecules to interact with. And so the H2 can only come in from one side. If Here's a surface right here. If there's a surface right here that your molecule is on, the H2 can only come in from this side. It can't come in from the back side because of the catalyst, the surface is there. So it can't come in. So it's syn addition of the H2 only. What this means, for example, is if we have this 1,2-cyclohexene, or 1,2-dimethylcyclohexene, if we add H2 palladium on carbon, the H2 will reduce the double bond to a single bond, adding hydrogens. And we will only get this beast right here with the CH3s are going to be on the same side. The H2s must come in the same side, syn addition. All right. Note this reaction is exothermic because this product or this reactant had a pi bond, no pi bonds here. Sigma bonds are stronger than pi bonds. Sigma bonds are more stable than pi bonds. So we got rid of this less stable pi bond and added a more stable sigma bond here. All right, uh, but there is something interesting and we'll get to your health in a minute. Uh, if you have, say, 2-butene, and here we have trans-2-butene, and you do H2 palladium carbon, that just gives you butane. If you have cis-2-butene, H2 palladium carbon, you get butane again. You get rid of the pi bond, which means now you've got a single bond here, and it can rotate. All right. Also, the more sterically hindered the double bond, the slower the hydrogenation. So if we have these two, this molecule here, note we've got a tri-substituted double bond here, only one hydrogen on it, a di-substituted double bond here, two hydrogens on it. If you put in one equivalent of H2 with palladium on carbon, it will reduce the less substituted double bond. The less substituted, the less stable the double bond. Also, the more substituted it is, it doesn't want to complex as readily to the catalyst surface. It doesn't want to lie flat on the surface as well if you got a lot of shrubbery on there. All right. Some more reactions to run. Um, recall, normally if we had an aldehyde and we wanted to make the primary alcohol, you could use NaBH4, sodium bihydride. You can use H2 palladium on carbon. It will do it also. That being the case, sodium borohydride is easy to use and it's cheap. H2, you've got to have a tank of hydrogen gas with all its safety restrictions. Palladium is not cheap. So yes, although you can reduce an aldehyde to an alcohol using H2 palladium on carbon, Sodium borohydride is the vastly preferred method if there's no other issues in your molecule. And the same way a ketone can be reduced to a secondary alcohol with H2 plated on, carbon, H2 plated on carbon, but sodium borohydride is the much more preferred choice if that's all that you're worried about and there's nothing else in your molecule to worry about. All right. Uh, well, let's look at your health a little bit now, um, because everyone agrees the best thing is butter. Butter's awesome. Um, butter is made from animal fats. Animal fats are saturated fats. So here's an animal fat right here. It's a triacylglycerol, although some people in the health profession call them triglycerides for short. 
technically a triglyceride, it's a triacyl glycerol, but you can't expect people to put in that acyl in there. All right, but it is saturated, which means you've got these uh, carboxyl groups here, these carboxylates, and you have just CH2, 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 CH2. There's no double or triple bonds or anything in there, except for that carbonyl. And that's for a nice solid fat at room temperature. Oils, however, at room temperature have these cis double bonds in there. Okay? And what happens is when you have cis double bonds, the next molecule of oil just doesn't fit well with here because you can stack when things are trans or when there's no double bonds, they stack nicely. But if you get another cis double bond in here, the, you're gonna have carbons interacting with each other trying to get too close around these cis double bonds it just doesn't stack well so since you ha when you have cis double bonds in your um, molecule it doesn't stack well it's probably gonna be a liquid at room temperature most of our natural oils are have they all have cis double bonds and they're often polyunsaturated uh, for example, vegetable oils, canola oil is a polyunsaturated oil with cis double bonds. Fish oil is polyunsaturated with three cis double bonds in there. There is one exception, olive oil. Olive oil actually only has one cis double bond. But note, in nature, for these oils, all of the double bonds that make them oily, that make them not stack very well together, they're all cis double bonds. That is why they do not stack very well together. Okay. But then people said, okay, that's good. It turns out these cis double bonds are better for you than the saturated fats you get from like butter. Yeah, it turns out saturated fats not as good for you. Uh, oils are better for you. I wouldn't. None of them in high amounts are good for you, but oils are better for you. So it's better to cook using olive oil than it is to use butter. But in America, we have a problem. I don't want to wake up in the morning, get a piece of toast dunk it in olive oil and spread grape jam on it. That just is not my bag. So I don't do that. We like butter. And so people said, well, butter is bad because it's saturated fat. Is there a way that we can take a better fat such as oil and change it into a solid that tastes like butter? And it turns out you can if you do it correctly. You just have to get rid of some of the cis double bonds is the whole trick. You know, if you've got these polyunsaturated fat molecules, get rid of one of the cis double bonds will make it easier to form a solid. So if you get some rid of the cis double bond, one of the cis double bonds, and while you make it, while you're doing this, you blow a bunch of air through it, you actually get this kind of semi-solid material. So if you add buttery flavoring to this kind of solidish material that has the benefits of tasting like butter, spreads like butter, but it's got unsaturated fats, so it is better for you. And that product is, yes, margarine. Uh, you will also note that margarine spreads a lot better than butter because when you're moving your knife through that margarine to get it out of the tub, there's a lot of air in there. It's like whipped up. And so the spread's easier. Everything is great. Everyone loves margarine. But then there's a problem because when you had to hydrogenate it, you had to partially hydrogenate it. So margarine is partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. We got rid of a couple of cis double bonds with H2 palladium on carbon. The problem is that those reactions are reversible. If we go back to the previous page, we recall that if you have transalkene with H2 palladium carbon, you get the alkane. Cisalkene gives you the alkane. So what happens if this reaction is reversed? What happens if, because you can under these conditions with palladium on carbon, you can get this reversed reaction to occur. So you started with trans, it went to just the normal alkane, and when it reversed, it can reverse to trans. However, the normal cane can actually undergo the verse, reverse reaction and go to cis. Which means if you started with the cis, just like our 
polyunsaturated fats and hydrogenated it, some of the molecules will convert to the alkane, the saturated fat, and then reverse themselves. But instead of cis, some of them will go into the trans form. And we call these molecules that do that, where before we hydrogenated it, all of the double bonds were cis double bonds. But after the partial hydrogenation, some of those cis double bonds actually got converted to trans double bonds. We call those trans fats. And it turns out there are a number of studies that have shown that trans fats are actually even worse for you than the butter, than the saturated fat. There's something about trans fats that makes it even worse for you than the saturated fat. So the age-old age old question, which is better for you, margarine or butter? The answer is, uh, whichever one you like, just don't eat a ton of it. You know, if you like butter, I like butter. Don't use a ton of butter. Use some butter, but don't use a lot. Don't get butter. Take it out of the fridge and eat it like it's a popsicle. Don't do that. Put butter on your toast, fine. Just don't put a lot of butter on your toast. If you're like, oh, I really like it, and so I'm going to get margarine instead, and you put a ton of margarine on your bread, well, that's not doing you any favors either. All right. However, uh, due to various laws and whatnot, there are much, uh, the, the margarine industry has updated their processes, so there's essentially no trans fats in the margarine anymore. So you don't have to worry about the trans fats. So I guess margarine's better for you, but it's whatever you prefer. All right. So, as we found out in previous chapters, whatever an alkene can do, an alkyne can often do. So let's hydrogenate alkynes. And when we do that, so here is 2-butyne. Recall this is straight. All four of those carbons are in a line. At H2 palladium on carbon, recall it's syn addition, means you get the cis alkene. However, you're never going to see that cis alkene because what do alkenes do when you have H2 palladium on carbon? Yeah, they're going to form the alkane. It turns out that if you had the alkyne and you only added one equivalent of H2 palladium on carbon, you're going to get a mess because as a reaction starts, you're going to start generating the cis alkene here. But some of the cis alkene is going to react with H2 to form the alkane. Some of this alkyne is going to react with H2, but since you only put one equivalent of H2 in there at the end, you've got alkane, you've got cis alkene, and you have leftover alkyne all mixed in there together. So if you're running this reaction, if you've got an alkyne and you're using H2 palladium on, H2 palladium on carbon, the only real thing you can do is to reduce it all the way down to the alkane, add two equivalents of H2 to that molecule because you just can't stop. There's no way to stop at the cis alkene. And now I know what you're saying. It's like, but, but Watson, I want to stop at the cis alkene. I don't want an alkane. Okay, we need to find a way. <clears throat> we need a specialized reagent. And good old Linlar came up with this specialized reagent. He realized that palladium on carbon is a really nice, good, active catalyst. So he needed a deactivated catalyst. He called it a poisoned catalyst. And instead of palladium on carbon, it's palladium on calcium carbonate with lead acetate and quinoline. Okay. H2, palladium on calcium carbonate with lead to acetate, and this is quinoline. And since a lot of people don't like saying palladium on calcium carbonate with lead to acetate and quinoline, we just say Linlar. So you will see this all the time, arrow H2 Linlar. Now recently they found there's a, a better way to do it, and so you will also find this Ni2B in the P2 form. And so if you see Linlar, Linlar's catalyst, palladium on calcium carbonate with uh, and quinoline, Ni2B in the P2 form, all of these are poison catalysts, they all do the same thing. They take your alkyne, reduce it to the cis alkene, and stop there. They stop at the cis alkene. And that is syn addition. 
And now you're saying, okay, that's great, but 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 I got my alkyne, and I want to stop at the alkene, but I want to stop at the transalkene. Well, if you're stopping at the transalkene, you can't have syn addition, you need anti-addition. If you need anti-addition, you cannot have a solid surface as your catalyst. You cannot have a lead surface as your catalyst because the other hydrogen can't come in from the other side. The lead is there. So if we can do that, though, with our... 2-butyne here and we use our dissolving metal reduction. Sodium or lithium in liquid ammonia. We'll take an alkyne, stop at the transalkene because it gives you anti-addition products. Okay. All right. Moving on, a lot of this we've discussed already in our scheme, so we'll go quickly through this. Uh, reduction of CX bonds, polar bonds. Uh, note, if we had CH3, CH2, CH2 um, with a carbonyl group, we know lithium aluminum hydride will reduce it. Hydride is a really good base. It's a really good nucleophile. So H- minus will attack this carbon and kick off this chlorine in an SN2 type fashion. Um, if we have a, an epoxide here, H- minus of hydride will come in and attack the less substituted carbon. It's a very strong base, strong nucleophile. SN2 attacks the less substituted carbon to give us this alcohol after aqueous workup, adding water to it to get the alcohol. And recall carboxylic acids and aldehydes with lithium aluminum hydride will make the alcohol. However, if you have an aldehyde instead of lithium aluminum hydride, use a sodium borohydride, live to fight another day. All right, that's good for uh, reducing agents. We'll go to oxidation in the next video.